You may think that my meta-analyses so far have been pretty in-depth, but nothing is gonna top today's one. In today's meta-analysis, we're gonna be taking a look at some of the results from Japan after the release of both Set 9 and the Messiah Stride deck set. Now I know what you're thinking in English, the Messiah Stride deck set released at the same time as Set 10, so technically Messiah is not relevant for the English meta, but I think in the interest of knowing what cards to buy early before they go up in price, it's useful to take a look at these deck lists, and it will be useful for the community overall, and it is gonna be a deck that you can expect that turn tournaments, whether it's BSF or BCS season, so regardless, we're going to include it in here as well. They were not just going to be taking a look at deck lists of the various decks that are top meta, but we're also going to take a look at variations of the deck list and some of the thoughts behind them for you to better understand which decks are the top and which playstyles of the top decks you might be better aligned with in your own personal playstyle. So I'm also doing this video a lot earlier than usual, this is typically closer to the English release date, but I wanted to get this out as we just had the conclusion of the Q Kyoto Deluxe, which of course was the first event of the entire Set 9 meta of the 2023 meta in general, and also of course the first event post Messiah's release too. So we're going to be including mostly results from that event because they did a top 16 cut, so we actually have more decks to work with in general, so that's actually very nice. And there's also a few other VGCSs that have happened after the Set 9 release that I'll use to feature some of the other decks that have not been featured from just the Kyoto results alone. I don't have a particular order in terms of nations and stuff this time around, we're going to just talk about decks in terms of the order I've set. Uh, mostly going to be talking about decks that have multiple entries slash variations and then after that we're going to list off a bunch of one ofs that popped up which will be pretty interesting there's stuff like leonorn and maelstrom and archite and stuff like that in here too so i think it'll be pretty exciting to take a look at first things first we're going to go over eva which is a deck that of course people would claim to be basically the number two best deck in the current format after chronojet and this first list is basically the japanese sort of template build so this was the first place in kyoto and essentially it is running the new promo assembler that i've talked about multiple times that works as a booster, the Tenkei booster, as well as an order searcher, but of course English does not have this card yet and we don't know yet how it's going to get it. So for the time being, you can run cards like the Wavy Loss as well as of course the Robust. And speaking of which, the second list for Eva that I want to show is actually one that does include Robust, which I think is a good card to make sure you just don't brick, right? The whole point of the new promo as well as Robust is just to make sure you don't brick and you do have your third order at all times. Of course, you do need to join to these cards, but Eva is a deck that thins so much that generally speaking, you do find your consistent pieces and then it's a question of how many combine rushers you want to be running in the free messiah meta i think two or three is fine but going into the messiah meta and onwards i think you might want to bump that combine rusher number back up to four because it will be getting bound sometimes which means it goes out of your drop zone rotation unless you overcall it with your obscadades in which case that's going to be the thing getting bound as well and overall we do notice that draws are basically now the main kind of trigger that we're playing instead of fronts partially because you kind of need them for the jet matchup simply because hitting a defensive draw here and there will help your hand just be able to stave off their huge and multiple attacks and on top of that there's a lot of other matchups where just 10k shield is very efficient and of course we do already have eight of them with obscadates but sometimes the 20k shield just does not come up enough outside of like mirror matches so the second eva build was the fourth place of kyoto now moving on to chronojet which of course english has just received i still need to do my in-depth deck profile of this but for now please do listen to what i have to say here because this will give you a pretty good grasp of what kind of different variations there are for Kronojet that you want to be aware of. So this first list is the first place from Kyoto and basically the differentiations that you see is basically in the three, two, and one counts. So what you can see in this build is that there are a lot less grade threes. So the reason why is because this kind of list is more geared towards playing the grade two game because here you have your staple grade ones in this, uh, you know, four steam breaths, the four GGs and the four swirlers, which are kind of like non-negotiable, right? You have to have these parts as your grade ones because GG Swirler is your best grade one opening. It draws you cards while brushing your opponent down, which means that you will just win through tempo, but also includes a slightly higher grade two count where we're not just running the upstream as well as the Argandia, but we're also running the Magician as well to make those really big Swirler columns and just also generate more soul for our GGs as well. And so this kind of list basically wants to actually play the grade two game against not just the mirror match but also against messiah now because that's another deck that needs to be you know both players on grade three to strike now if we take a look at the second place list for jet here you can see a much higher count of grade threes and much lower count of grade twos where here you can basically tell that this player doesn't aim to play the grade two game as much and basically just rides up most likely against most matchups because the problem with running a lot of grade threes if you're planning to you know stay on your grade two and not you know and just deny stride 
usually that means that if you have a bunch of grade threes in the deck your draw for turn slash draw of gg will be a piece that you cannot use if you're grade two gaming so basically if you're running a lot of grade threes that kind of tells that you're going to be riding up and just kind of like letting your opponent first stride is if it is a mirror match so that's very important to point out because that kind of tells a lot about the play style here as well as if you for example are not comfortable with grade two gaming but you still want to play jet at an event or practice it that means that you can adapt one of these lists and basically aim for higher grade three firepower like the higher body food numbers also mean that you can actually use it as an attacker a lot more as well not just as a discard fodder so that's also a very important thing to keep track of next the fifth place jet list actually plays jewel core so this one is a bit higher so the grade three lineup is the same as the first place list but here we're actually playing less grade twos and more grade one so we're putting in jewel core because it's another strong aggressive piece that you can aggro with in your early turns slash use it as a strong booster that also generates soul after its battle so it's not going to generate soul in the main phase unlike swirler and gungun ram which you can then immediately convert into a draw from gg but this will generate the soul for later turns because gg is basically the mvp of the deck that you always want to be using to keep generating more and more hand while also outputting good numbers on the field and then finally this ninth place list for chrono jet runs an even higher grade 3 count and cuts down on one of the argandias by basically still being pretty high in the grade 3 count as you'll notice but running three copies of the gungan ram so gungan ram of course generates soul for your gg while also being able to soul blast 3 to draw cards it's a lot heavier than soul blast 2 to draw card like gg does but this will still generate you enough hand advantage while also generating soul and being an early beat stick much like every other grade one in the lineup so i hope looking at these four different jet lists from the tournament because jet is the most popular deck in the whole tournament it has a total of 11 out of 16 spots in the top 16 here so jet is by far the most popular but there are really interesting variations between the lists that i think should be highlighted and that will tell you maybe like how you want to play this deck and maybe something that you might not have known about how to build it as well because there are template builds for jet but there are little variations that really go a long way depending on how you want to play the deck and sometimes if you want to build jet in a way that wants to play grade 2 game running a bunch of grade 3 just doesn't make any sense and now for the part of the video that you probably want to see the most which is of course the messiah segment so messiah literally just released not even a week ago here in japan and it is the new stride deck set that initially i think when we were seeing the reveals people were like ah, i'm not sure if it's gonna be that good then on day one it came out and the day one and day two people were like oh this deck is so amazing and then the, the, the days following that people started realizing oh hmm this deck has no early game it cannot grade two game and has a bunch of different issues so basically there's been very mixed reactions to messiah but in the end it's still very popular and also very strong but that might be partially just because of new deck bias right this is the newest thing on the block and people are like well if chrono jet was so good and this thing has a crest too surely messiah will be good too sadly it's not as good as jet but it's still a pretty good deck i'd put it somewhere in like the high tier two like very very high tier two but let's talk about some lists and we're gonna have a total of seven different ones to talk about because there's so many different ways to build this deck first one is gonna be the second place basically template messiah list so as you can see here we're actually not maxing out on the alter ego the main grade three i do recommend maxing out on it and instead we see that they're running basically four of the backup grade three that helps you draw cards when you pitch it for stride as well as being a 23k beater which is really important and then of course the non-included cards from the actual stride deck set are the flats and sphere which is the grade two that essentially allows you to retire a card in the same column as her the reason why this is played is because it's mainly for the stride deck set matchups so basically against chrono jet and messiah where they're going to be playing grade two game against you and trying to deny stride and you can use her as a tool to get rid of your opponent's rears while also bashing back so she can technically be like two removals in one if you attack into your opponent's rears as well which oftentimes when you're grade two gaming that might be what you're going to be doing and then running two copies of the grade one mikani which of course was a very popular topic uh not so long ago because mikani generates two souls for one so it's a one card that goes to soul then soul charges one and of course alter ego messiah's skill is when a card is unlocked you can soul boss one to draw a card so it's not once per turn so the more soul you have and the more stuff unlocks that's how much you can draw so if you unlock three of your cards and your opponent unlocks one of theirs you can soul blast four to draw four that's really really strong that's basically one of like the big pushing points of this deck but it has big weaknesses and that is super piece reliant like you have to have one of your two grade two pieces between the arrester and the uh karza because those are the two cards that can actually lock your front row so that you can unlock them again with your first stride in order to do five attacks and then also you need to sacrifice messiah for like the back row self-lock so that you can actually draw more cards off of the alter ego while also generating counter charge so it's a very peace reliant deck and honestly like i wonder if three draws is even enough so we'll talk about them more as we go through these decks the next list is with three mikanis from the fourth place 
This is probably one of my favorite kind of lists. So if you do have grade one mechanics, this is probably the list I would recommend the most and the list that I'm probably going to be testing the most. I also really like the four draws because this tech really wants to hit defensive draws just to randomly draw into its combo pieces because you, as I said before, you simply have to find the combo pieces and otherwise you are going to be struggling. This next one is a top eight list or sixth in Swiss list for Messiah. So here we can see it is a basically a stride deck set almost out of the box, only running two destiny dealers for that stride for our cost but we actually see two, see two copies of the claw which is the grade one that works as a tanky shield and also puts itself to the soul after it battles which is really nice because of course it is only one soul provided but it's a body in the board you can use in the battle phase slash use as a shield so there is actually like reasons to weigh this card against mikani because while mikani generates one more soul this card is actually usable in battle and also is a defensive card which mikani is not so there are multiple ways of looking at it the trigger lineup for this deck i don't agree with too much because it's only running one draw and two fronts i tried out front myself as well but it felt like i was just like struggling in the early game way too much but the big interesting point here is that instead of using Mikani to generate soul, this player is using three prisons to generate soul. So the prison, while it does have, you know, all the prison shenanigans attached to it, the effect when you put it in the order zone is just to, you know, by resting one of your units, you get to soul charge three when you put it into the order zone. So that means that three soul charge will actually be soul that you can use for your alter ego messiah to draw more cards. Of course, you don't want to overdo it because that's going to deck you out eventually. So you probably play like two of these per game, but playing a third just to make sure you see two is important or even just see one right because you only really need that soul when you go into for example your turn four because on turn three let's say you went second you will use up the existing soul you have which is usually three in order to draw three but then you have an empty soul so then you start wanting things like mikani and things like the prison so that's why you see a lot of mikani's being played at two or three copies instead of four because at, as a four of you're using as an early beater more than anything and then only really putting it to the soul on like turn four and onwards so I really like this prison tech and um, of course prison is you know a common from a 300 yen start deck slash five dollar start deck so it's um it should be pretty easy to build this because it's basically just a stride deck set out of the box plus a couple commons next we have the seventh place list and this one is a lot more about the grade two game so here we see again the effect crits are coming back so again it's like it's kind of kind of depends like some players are kind of opting to play non-effect crits just to have better columns and some are playing to play the effect crits in order to have the soul but here you can see four mikani and four of the platinum basically what this means is that you are 100 focused on the greek 2 game and trying to make sure that you can push in the early turns as well and not so much like keeping your hand and like you know scavenging resources for your first strike turn to make the big combos and instead you're pushing your opponent early so that on the first strike turn even if you just do like three or four attacks you are still pushing for game a lot faster i don't particularly agree with the way that the karta is played as just a two of like karta and arrestor are your only ways to make multiple attacks on these strike turns until you go into Exilix. So I think for that reason, you should really pay attention to these counts and uh, definitely like try to draw into them. And of course, track your resources so you find them too. This ninth place list is actually Mikani list. So here again, we are playing not three copies of the flat 10 just to have that grade two game option. And then basically there is no way to generate extra soul in this deck. Like there is none of the claw. There is no Mikani, no prison. This list is basically trying to probably push quite a bit in the early game and then then finish the game by like you know basically draw your cards on the first strike turn and then finish the game on the second strike turn and then just don't care about the draws because your opponent should be dead before you reach your end phase i think it's a bit of a risky play style and there's a lot of slower decks in this meta that are just super tanky like eva in particular that just does not really care about you trying to win fast it will prolong the game no matter what so i think that this plan can work out in some ways but it feels a bit dangerous but it's another build that's worth paying attention to then we have this 12th place messiah list and this one is literally out of the box like this is the what you get in the product add in some effect draws and crits and that is it so i think if you are trying to just like play messiah without necessarily picking up mikanis and stuff as you can see there's been multiple lists in this these decks that we featured that did really well at this tournament like you could not make top cut unless you were x1 and while it was a team tournament like this deck does have to hold its weight in order to win at some point so it's really interesting how uh this list worked out so honestly very interesting out of the box list and then finally this one's one of my favorites we have a 
list that was 13th in Swiss, which I call the five PGs list, because you might be looking at it going, okay, we have our combo pieces, only three sacrifice, a little bit strange, and our four mechanics, okay, going pretty hard on that. But then you look down to the bottom right and you see a copy of the set one common blitz order that says count us two to play it to give your Vanguard plus 30k for that battle. So it's basically a perfect guard that only, you know, many decks will get, you know, shut down by it as a PG, but other decks will break through this power. But I actually really like this one of blitz order play because there is one really cool reason for it, and that is Sacrifice Messiah. So Sacrifice Messiah locks itself after battle and gives plus 5k to your Vanguard. And if you have nothing faced up in the damage zone, then it counter charges one. So most of the game, it's actually only self-locking itself and giving plus 5k to Vanguard without the counter charge because you haven't used that much CB yet. Like the only things that use CB in this deck are your G zone as well as the strike skill. So in order to actually make Sacrifice's counter charge go live, so you can counter charge two per turn, is actually to just blow more of your CB out. So using this Blitz order as an additional perfect guard is actually pretty smart, and I'm a big fan of this play. So could be an interesting adaptation. Um, I'm actually quite a big fan of it. So that's all the Messiah lists. I hope this gave you a good idea of how to build Messiah, because there's honestly just so much variance to it and so many different ways to build it. There are no more WGPs for the rest of this month, so this is the only one, but there are some like VGCSs and unofficial events where we'll have results from. But we'll see how the Messiah list continue to adapt, and I think in particular, the Ava matchup is not as good as I expected. So I'm curious if maybe we're going to start seeing like Taser Lages being played in these lists instead, because Taser Lage would be a super huge card against Ava because you get to rest their grade 2 obscurate that they top deck off of the grade 3 order, and therefore they cannot take out your front row because the grade 2 obscurate literally wins this matchup for Ava because they get to take out your combo pieces and your strong attackers every turn if they keep top decking it and calling off with an effect, whether there's Ava's effect or the grade 3 order. Next, I don't talk about this deck in meta analysis too much, but I feel like just to kind of have it archived, even though it's probably never going to come into English. Abisu. Abisu came first, and there are some things to talk about just because it's gone through a restriction where the card Anastasia has gone to one, who's basically an infinite countercharger, but Abisu is basically like full power V-series Gurgrit, but now it's been nerfed to not be that crazy, where basically on attack gets to call out two cards with different names from your monster box to like one column, and then choose an opponent's rearguard with the same grade as the called unit and retire it. And then when you guard, when she's being attacked, you can discard one to choose as many cards from your monster box as you want with different names and guard with them. So it's literally like Gurgit on steroids. This deck can like freeze your opponent's Vanguard power at 8k, like it's Valios or something, and then do a bunch of like five attack swings with huge power on top of that. But there's some interesting cards being played here. So for example, the uh, Dintu is a great three that basically says like, if you Persona Road this turn, then when this attacks, it attacks your opponent's entire front row. So this is a card that's been put into the deck just to deal with the Evo matchup, which is really interesting. So it's a huge change. And the Rad line has changed completely too, where now the Fujin Raijin is being played, where when this is ridden or called, you Soul Blast once to switch for a different name Fujin Raijin, and then at the end of the battle it was boosted, you can put one of your other Fujin Raijin rear guards to the bottom of the deck to retire an opponent's rear, so that's actually really big against a bunch of matchups like Jet, where the retire actually hurts them quite a lot. And then the grade 1 Fujin Raijin doesn't do anything, it's just a vanilla basically, because it only works when you ride it, but basically this grade 2 just searches out the grade 1 to be like a booster for the sake of retire, slash just a card in hand to guard with, or you know, discard for a PG or something. Then we have a second place Mega Lonozuchi, this is a promo that definitely will come out in English eventually because monthly bush road promos tend to come out eventually um, and we kind of know that they're like usually sneak peek promos. So Mega Lonozuchi is what Shiten Doji wanted to be. Sorry, not Shiten Doji, Shoujo Doji. And this build in particular I'm a really huge fan of. So what Mega Lonozuchi says is he has three abilities. The first one is you choose one or more cards from your soul and put them into your bind zone and then for this turn he gets the names of all of your grade one or greater stealth units that are in your bind zone. So it like you can basically bind everything on your first grade 3 turn to have a bunch of different names and then on your second grade 3 turn you can just like bind one thing and he will just get the names of everything that's in the bind zone so you don't have to like kept, keep rebinding things just to inherit those specific names he in inherits everything that's in the bind zone and the reason why he does that is because you can cb1 and put two regards to the soul to search the deck for two cards of the same name as himself and call them to rear and give them plus 5k power so because they're the same name as himself he can copy anything that he has inherited so if you inherit some like really good cards you can call them out and if your opponent's Vanguard is grade 3 or greater, then all of your rear guards that share the same name as him that are stealth rear guards get to attack from the back row. So this is pretty big because that means you're attacking six times while thinning your deck and setting up your bind zone. You have this Shoujo Doji ride line that sets up your bind zone and your soul all the time. And by putting any Shoujo Doji to your bind zone, so like the grade 2 or the grade 1, you inherit the Shoujo Doji name. That means you can play the Unpreceden, which is the set 8 triple rare that says when it's placed by an ability on 
on rear. If you have a Tamayura or Shoujo Doji Vanguard, you Sobas want to draw a card, and he also gets plus 10k if he has seen two or more of your rears being put to soul this turn. So basically, it's a 23 slash 20k attacker if you call it off of the snake, and it's also Sobas want to draw a card. So you can basically call out two of him from the snake and then call another from hand all in the back row, and they will be like 28, 28, and 18k attackers, or or rather 23k attackers respectively, that draw you cards, right? So it's pretty damn good. You have the Tsumugi, who Sobas one on play to choose a stealth normal unit from your drop and put it back into your soul, so that way you can rebind something that got retired or you called over or got got out of the bind zone. You have Folktale, of course, who is a stealth searcher, so obviously she's gonna be a auto include in this deck. And then another interesting card is the Coal Mount, which is when placed from hand on rear, you can count must one to choose an opponent's card in your opponent's bind zone and put it to bot deck. But if you did not, then you choose a card from your bind zone, and if it's a equal to or lower grade than your Vanguard and a stealth unit, then you can call it a rear. So if you bound a bunch of stuff with Megalonozuchi, but then you want to bring them back out, well, you just use him for CB1 and call them back out. So it's a really, really interesting card. I think if you like, like, Hyuga back in V-Series, this is going to be a deck that's super close to that. So I hope that they bring out this promo pretty soon for English, because it's a really, really cool card. Now for a couple decks that we have seen in the last meta analysis, so I'm not going to spend too long on them. We have Overlord that was in sixth place. Basically the usual Overlord that you're used to seeing, because this time we're just basically playing the end in the ride line, and it is, you know, a way to just have the end be stronger and faster than before, and we already talked about this last week as well. And then we have Minerva. As we can see, Japan has basically fully gone on the Karubere Minerva build instead of the Kadwala. I still think both are quite viable and honestly quite equal in that sense as well. As long as you're maxing out on the Genesis cards, playing Drilling Angel to recycle stuff and Karubere slash Kadwala to extend slash build board, I think you are fine for a Minerva deck. Another list that we've seen already was in the top 16 as well, which was Letitia. So this is actually the same player for Letitia, I think, as well. It's just Bran basically doing his thing. So Letitia as still popping up here and there, but a lot less than before. And now we get into some interesting decks that have not popped up much lately. And first, we're going to actually have Leonorn. So this Leonorn was seventh place in Kyoto, and it basically is running a super heavy grade one lineup with the Zorga ride line. So we still use Resonance Dragon, of course, to restand our rears. But here we have a new promo that came out as a shop tournament promo for Leonorn, which says when it's placed by a ability onto Rear Circle, you may soul charge one, which of course is really important because Leonorn soul blasts one every time for, you know, her ability. And when this boosts, if you have a Leonorn Vanguard, the other unit in this column gets plus 5k. So what's really cool is that you can put this to your left or right back row regard circle, and when he boosts twice, this will give plus 10k to the thing in front. What's important about this is because Resonance Dragon restands the front row to attack again, you will basically be buffing up the thing that restands twice. So that's really, really big. On top of that, every single Stokia deck right now is running the Horuhuru Mushroom, who goes to Soul to make two plant tokens. And if you're playing Grand Fia, it also gives a regard power. But putting it into Soul to make two tokens is huge because you're generating Soul in most of these decks that really need the Soul while making 5k power rearguards for no cost. So the Mushroom is just an auto include in everything because, you know, tokens are just good. And then we have this uh, Giant. So this thing says, once per turn, when your other unit is stood by a card ability, you can Soul Blast one, and for that turn, this unit gets plus 10k power. So this can be a really good attacker to restand with the Resonance Dragon and buff up with the promo. And just in general, it's like an, because you're soul charging slash generating soul from the mushroom a little bit more than before, you are also able to, you know, turn that soul into more power. That way your rearguard swings are actually pretty threatening and not just kind of like your vanguard is the big threatening swing and nothing else. And this is where we see the return of Happy Dreaming Festa because now CB1 to look at top seven to find two grade one or lowers is actually pretty viable because we're running 12 good grade ones that we want to hit. So really like this Leonorn list, honestly. It's really, really cool. And overall, I think I hope to see more of Leonorn going into the future tournaments. Next, we have Maelstrom finally making a appearance. There were a couple of Maelstrom lists, but I'll just feature one here because they were quite similar. I know a lot of people last time around were hoping to see some Maelstrom and did not. So here it finally is. So Maelstrom, of course, basically is able to call out either from Soul or from Drop, either Aqua Force cards or your Tear Dragons. And of course, there's a lot of good Tear Dragon contenders. Of course, Inlet Pulse generates card draw, generates soul. Very good tier dragon. We have a new one in set 9, which is the uh, Hideline Dragon. So this one says, if this turn you've Persona Road, you can Soul Blast 1, choose another rear guard or choose another unit, sorry, and give that unit plus this unit plus 10k, which is huge, like actually a lot of power. Some people play more than one copy of this, by the way. Title Assault for that multi-attack. Of course, the Wheel Assault for the ability to just reposition your rear guards. Diansa to revive things like Inlet Pulse that you've Soul Blasted. And then the Ryuka, which is, of course, the self-retired 
to give a rearguard plus 10k effect, which is just really nice because your rearguards are going to be attacking multiple times, whether it's through Maelstrom's effect or through something like their own effects like Tidal Assault. Next, Archite managed to get a top as well. And this Archite list is a bit different from the one from Esse that I uh, featured last time. So here we're running Robust to make sure we have the three copies of the order, which we need to do in order for Archite's full effect to be unleashed in order to not just call stuff, but also set up the order zone continuously. And then four copies of all the good Kaiju. So basically the grade three that retires, the grade two that acts as extra shield, as well as, of course, the Wavy Loss, which is going to solve us to draw cards, the GG of the deck, plus three copies of Bubble Mine, which not maxed out, but still very good because it is a soul and a counter charge in this deck is really, really nice. Plus, of course, you are able to pump it if you have an extra copy in the Bind Zone that can then go back to deck and you're going to keep drawing into it. So in general, like Archite is just like the budget, really nice deck for Brankate, of course. Like Wavy Loss, I guess, is not exactly the cheapest card in Bubble Mine. I mean, it's getting reprinted like two times in English now because you're getting it in set nine and then in the festival collection too. So honestly, I think this deck will continue to be pretty accessible, hopefully, hopefully. And so I do recommend picking it up. And so now we've looked through all of these WGP results and you've seen the pie chart and you're probably asking yourself, where the hell did Youthberg go? I mean, Youthberg was 50% of the decks that people brought to Worlds. What happened to Youthberg? What is it doing? Why is there not a single Youthberg in top 16? And honestly, I don't really know. Like it's honestly a mystery why there's no Youthbergs, but in some of the VGCSs that have happened throughout this time, there have been some Youthbergs. So in the Oyoroko VGCS, which is a VGCS that I got second in, one of my teammates was running Youthberg, and this is basically the post set nine Youthberg. As you can see, it doesn't change too much. We're running four of the Tempest, three of the Gust, and then basically you've cut some of those like other kind of search cards for three copies of Doorbreak, because Doorbreak is actually pretty good grade two. It's a card that says when your Vanguard is placed by Revolt Dressing, you give your Vanguard plus 5k, so that extra plus 5k is going to ask for more shield, especially on like Tempest turns, which are like single drives. So your opponent kind of tries to like guard that with raw shield value instead of PGing. And when he attacks a grade three or greater, you can Soul Blast one of your Revolt Forms to give him plus 10k. So he actually hits for a pretty big number. Youthberg is another interesting card that like if Messiah started playing the Taser Lage, this is another deck that would get really hurt because calling out your Ezrite Angels mid battle phase would actually get them rested. So that would be also pretty interesting. Then there was a top three or third place MLB list at the same VGCS and so MLB got some pretty cool support through its new promo which of course enables you to essentially call out Blaster Dark and Blaster Blade from your soul to the same column and give them boost so you basically get a fourth attack in MLB which has actually helped the deck a lot because of course you lose some of that like shield power the deck had on the opponent's turn unless you have an extra pair of Blaster Dark and Blaster Blade in your soul somehow and you basically get to turn that into extra attacks which is also really strong because you're able to search out stuff with Emmeline and the uh, Karubere and the Dragon Tree Grade 1 actually helps to draw cards as well because when another unit is placed in front of him in the same column, you can almost want to draw cards. So if you need to burn a bunch of CB, then you can do that. But I'm honestly kind of concerned for the CB of this deck because it's like, if you use Blaster Blade on the right line, then that's one CB. If you use the promo, that's a CB. If you use Karubere, that's a CB. And then the, the Dragon Tree card is a CB. So a little bit concerned about the CB of this deck. And also interesting that they don't play the Keter OT, they actually play the Vanilla OT instead here. And then we have a Bastion list. I got four at the same VGCS, so this is including the new Hammer Girl. So Dark Strain, surprisingly missing an action, and instead the Hammer Girl has been adapted. I have to be honest with you, I have not really seen any Bastions running around ever since this event. Um, this was basically held like a couple days, I think the day after or two days after the set had come out. So I think people were just kind of testing out with the new decks, but for those of you that are, you know, Bastion fans, this is a deck that you might want to consider picking it up. And honestly, Bastion is like a very underrated um, budget deck at this point. Like it's a budget meta deck that I think is like still pretty good. I wouldn't necessarily call it top meta, but it's still quite strong. And then finally from the Oritan Cup, there was a fourth place Avangarda, and I've been really enjoying playing this list. Avangarda is basically Overlord at home for Brankate, but it includes the really interesting tactics cards, which are set orders that you put into your soul with your Vanguard effect to give your Vanguard the restand ability. But those do all kinds of different things. The grade one retires something. The grade two gives you power and turns off your opponent's blitz orders and intercept, which is pretty huge against certain matchups and just turning off the blitz PG is also big. And then the grade three one basically turns your entire board into a powerhouse. 
after your Persona Ride turn because you will be restanding consistently. So this deck is kind of like the typical thing for Brankit where you're like deck thinning a bunch, you can search out your Persona Rides with the Freiheits, search out your orders and whatnot, and then you also have the Enter Ray that can basically be used for draw cycling just to make sure you like your hand quality is good and you're not like clogged up with orders and stuff. So I really recommend giving this deck a try. I played it at a couple locals myself and just had a lot of fun with it. So honestly, really, really recommend it. And now you may have noticed that I've been keeping one deck relatively quiet. And that of course is the CEO himself Wellstra. Now this deck in my opinion is the crest killer like it is the crest slayer and this is the deck that beats all the crest decks because of how crazy its buff is so of course this build specifically is very much a japanese build because we don't know when assembler is coming out yet in english which is again the set order searcher which is really big in this deck and also the thing that gets boost if you call anything out by an effect which you do at certain stages of the game here in this deck so i'll take a little bit longer to break this down i will be doing a deck profile for wellstra as well though so wellstra's ride lines grade one sucks let me just tell you this way so what you see a lot of people do is they play bait so what you notice here Arupaka who made top eight played the grade zero and grade one eva because and also running one copy of the eva grade one research it doesn't have to be the grade one research you can play the grade three for example and you don't set it you just bait your opponent. You bait your opponent into thinking you're playing Ava, and then bait them into thinking you threw and you're misplaying and they're, they get cocky and start pushing. This is literally it. Like, dude, like, I'm being very serious here. And then you ride into the grade two of the Rind line, which is where things get really good. So the grade two says you saw us want to choose one product in your order zone and operate it. And the card you want to be operating is the brand new grade two product card, which is the Rubertal. Rubertal is a really insane card that says when you set it, you draw one and Soul Charge 1. No conditions, no questions asked. You get two cards out of playing it, which is really, really good. And on top of that, when you operate it, if it's during your main phase, you look at top five to call one unit card from among them. And if it's during your battle phase, you draw a card. So on turn two, you soul blast one, operate it, look at top five and call one. You also drew a card from setting it, which is also really nice. And you generated the soul that you're going to soul blast for it. And then when the grade two is ridden over by Wellstra, you choose one of your products in the order zone and put it to the drop. And you search your deck for a grade two product and then set it. So this can be the one of uh, Freischutz because the grade two Freischutz is not really that good. The Freischutz maximum is the one that you really want to go into because the grade three Freischutz says you cannot play it normally. So you have to set it either through the grade two Freischutz effect, which you only do when you have no CB or if you're breaking and you're not finding a key card that we'll talk about in a second. But the operate effect of it is that you get to minus 5k to your opponent's vanguard and also retire one of their rears. And then if you want, you can CB one and bounce one of your rear guards to call this out as a 23 K that will go back to the orders at the end of turn. So basically you can do up to five attacks in this deck, do up to like minus 15k on your opponent's vanguard and retire up to three cards per turn. Chrono Jet is really weak when you retire their back row swirlers and GGs. Messiah literally crumbles because you retire their key combo pieces. And the reason why you're able to do so much retire is because of Fry Heights. This card is insane. When you call it, if your order zone has a set order, you CB1 discard one, search your deck for either a card of the same name as your vanguard if you want to Persona Ride, or a product card and reveal that it's your hand. And if you have a Wellstra Vanguard, you can choose a product card from your hand and put it into your order zone. So it skips the condition or the restriction of the Freischutz Maximum that it cannot be played, but it can be set forcefully through Freiheits. And then Freiheits says when it attacks the Vanguard, if you have a Wellstra Vanguard, you can Soul Blast 2 to operate one of your products, which means that you get to operate through Wellstra's effect, which is on attack to operate something for free. And then Freiheits can, you can use twice to Soul Blast 4 in one turn in order to operate your orders three times per turn. So obviously you're going to need some soul. The bubble mine is going to help that and also counter charge because you're CBing a lot in this deck, partially because you have to CB for Freiheit's search effect and also CB for the maximum's effect to, you know, call itself out of the order zone. And so overall, like this deck is honestly pretty technical. There's a lot of little sequencing that will tire you out. So like playing this deck for a whole day of tournaments is going to be pretty tiring, but I love it. It is super, super cool and a very strong counter pick right now in this meta. So I featured the Arupaka list, but this is the 11th place list that is a prison bait one instead of being Eva bait, where you run basically Sora period as a starter, and then Kidna Blue is the grade one to search out the prison and then don't set it. You can actually set it eventually if you need the soul, because you do soul blast two for fly heights every time you use this effect. But this list is also running a 1-1 line of the main phase operator as well as the uh if you didn't counter charge yet, soul blast one to counter charge one, grade two as well. Now for a list that is a bit more English buildable, I will just introduce my teammates list that we 
uh, played together in the VGCS in Oyoroko. So this Wildstra is like completely English buildable. There's nothing that is not going to be in English in this list. It is running the full ride line. So I do recommend being a little bit cocky and just playing like Eva or Prison if you want to like throw your opponent off. And instead of playing like the grade one product, because the grade one product really sucks, we'll see if that changes with the Doggo promo that just came out. And then of course you're running two copies of the grade two countercharger because you see be a lot more in this version of the deck because you're running four copies of the Iskura. So Iskura is if you have not activated a product yet this turn, Kalmos one and rest her to operate one of your products. So it's really good because it's an operation, but the issue is that of course you CB way more than before. So you will run into CB issues along the way. And that is finally it. We have broken down every single list that I wanted to do in this video. And as I told you before, this is the longest, I think, and most in-depth analysis of the meta that I've done so far. I want to do these most more frequently just because like there's so much to talk about. I'm so passionate about like finding these little things, like even looking at Chronojet lists and finding little differences and like what dictates the opponent's playstyle is super super cool. So let me know what your favorite part of this meta analysis was and are you excited for this meta as well? What kind of decks are you playing right now and how are you preparing for the BSF season if you are preparing for it? And if there's any other things regarding the current standard meta you wish for me to talk about, please do leave them in the comments as well. And of course, if you like this video, please do give it a like. And if you haven't already, please do subscribe. And if you want to support me in other ways and do, you know, just what I do, please do consider becoming a YouTube channel member as well. But otherwise, that's going to be it for me today. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Bye bye.